Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the brand new episode of the Life Positive Show. I hope all of you are taking good care of yourself and thinking positive. The topic for tonight is the symbolism behind Hindu gods. Most people, especially the non-Hindus, look at our deity worship with despair. They think, why is it that our gods have multiple hands, heads, uh, have animal companions, and some even look like animals? Even Hindus worship their deities without trying to understand the spiritual significance of their physical form. Have you ever wondered why is it that the way they look the way they do? Is there any deep meaning which they want to convey to us through their appearance, which we have never tried to uh, understand or find out? To understand this, symbolism, the language of symbols in which our gods are speaking to us, we have with us Arjuna Raghuram. Archana Raghuram, whose talk on quantum physics and Vedanta has become hugely popular among the netizens of India, is the former CEO, United Way Chennai, and for, former senior director, Cognizant. She was awarded the prestigious Forbes India Philanthropy Award in the Good Samaritan category by Forbes India magazine. She was honored as one of the 100 most creative people in business by a leading US publication, Fast Company. She has a YouTube channel called Temples, Books, and Science, where she shares her knowledge on Hindu philosophy, temples, and books that are in the, at the intersection of science and spirituality. So thank you, Arjuna, for being on the show tonight, for being for all My the pleasure, Shibi. and the subscribers of Life Positive. We have come here to discuss this very, very fascinating topic of the symbolism behind Hindu gods. Achana has a wealth of wisdom. She is very deeply rooted in Vedanta, science, and the intersection at which both of these meet. So of which she is very well rooted in these subjects and is capable of shedding light on certain mystical aspects of our religion, which we have never uh, cared to know about. <laughs> So why do you think that our gods look the way they do? So, so can you uh, give us some example of the symbolism and embedded in their physical form? Okay. See, traditionally, uh, Shivi, we have a culture of embedding knowledge in our art, in our literature, in our poetry. So all our uh, Puranic stories are allegorical. See, mm -hmm. they have, there is, there are demons and gods and uh, uh, they're fighting wars. But at a deeper level, they have deep symbolism and deep philosophical meaning. So most of our Puranic stories are allegories. And this kind of metaphors are used even in how our gods are represented. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of you go walk in and we see those four hands and weapons. And to most people who are non-Hindus who have not been exposed to them from childhood, they appear very weird. But mm -hmm. all of them have deeply... Uh, uh, deep significance and a lot of it is connected to our uh, Vedanta, the, the philosophy of our uh, Vedas. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, tell you first, how, when was the first time I understood there was symbol, symbolism in our uh, gods? I have been like, we have been exposed to gods from childhood, going to temples and this puja room at home. Then mm -hmm. once I was in college, I read this uh, beautiful uh, description of Ganesha. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Ganesha has many different... Uh, so many layers of symbolism in him, the mm. form of Ganesha. But one I found most intriguing was the first one which I've read about Ganesha. See, Ganesha means a leader. Gana is a group and Isha is Lord. Mm. A Lord, a person who leads a group. Mm. So Ganesha, literally, the Sanskrit meaning of Ganesha is a leader. Mm. And all the leadership qualities are embodied in the form of Ganesha. You know, Ganesha has elephant head. Mm. I'm not going to put up an image of Ganesha. Most of us know how Ganesha looks. Mm -hmm. So he has an elephant head. So mm -hmm. the large ears represent the ability to listen. You know, mm -hmm. one of the important skills a leader should have, good listening skills. His broad head represents intelligence. Mm -hmm. His tiny eyes you know, represents concentration. And the trunk of the elephant, it mm -hmm. is supposed to have a wide range. Mm -hmm. It can pick up a needle and also uproot a tree. So that should be the range of leader skills, ability to look at the smallest details and the large big picture also. Mm -hmm. 
and big stomach represents the ability to digest anything you know all the shocks you absorb and digest no that is big tummy and then his vahanam is a little mouse mm. mouse represents the ego because mm. uh, mouse is very destructive you no know? it keeps nibbling on things destroying lot of things so mm. it represents the ego and uh, an ego is essential for a leader because mm. only then he can have belief in his vision mm. only then he can sell his vision and lead a set of people but the ego of a leader should be small and under his control so that it doesn't over uh, it doesn't blind him to new ideas to people who don't necessarily agree with him but who may have brilliant ideas so his ego should be under check although he rides on his ego it should be small and under his control so all the qualities that embody a leader all the leadership qualities are represented in the form of ganesha so i found this very very fascinating and then when i got truly interested in the subject is in my vedanta class you know my teacher Mm-hmm. my guru was explaining the symbolism of chin mudra mm-hmm. this is a mudra you know mm-hmm. how every even the smallest detail of our deities have so much meaning in it mm-hmm. chin mudra is also called jnana mudra this is how mm-hmm. it looks you know right, this is right. how it looks so if you see if you have noticed if you go to temples any form of god as a guru in the form mm-hmm. of a teacher will hold this mudra mm-hmm. so shiva as dakshina murti is form of shiva as a guru and he will have this mudra Mm-hmm. similarly vishnu who is uh, as hayagriva hayagriva is the teacher form of uh, vishnu who is as the guru form mm-hmm. he will also have this mudra mm-hmm. and he was explaining what is the meaning of this mudra so this particular mudra summarizes the entire teaching of vedanta so if you look at this hand this represents the ego the index finger because it keeps pointing at everybody judging other people creating trouble so the index finger is the ego and the other three fingers are body mind and intellect body mm. mind and intellect mm. so what happens is ego is always associated with this body mind or intellect so i say i'm this body when i talk to I talk about my age or my height or my weight i'm i'm associating with my body then sometimes i talk about my emotions i'm angry i'm in love i hate somebody so then i'm associating with my mind then when i'm thinking i'm reasoning i'm associating with my intellect so this ego is thinking that i am one of these three things i'm this body mind and intellect and the thumb represents god because the hand cannot function without the thumb mm-hmm. and it is away from the oh wow from the other three lovely so that lovely the thumb represents god uh-huh. so what happens as long as this ego is associated with this limited things body mind and intellect you mm-hmm. will always be limited just like a line has a beginning and end you will always have a beginning and end right. you will be born and you die but once you realize that this is not you your true true nature is god you are one with god and you associate yourself with god you become complete how a circle has no beginning or end mm-hmm. you attain immortality you become beginningless and endless and in this tiny tiny mudra which you hardly notice you how many times you go to temple and see dakshina murti you would hardly notice him him holding this mudra but in this tiny mudra they summarize the entire teaching of vedanta this is vedanta this is the crux of vedanta and they have summarized it so this is the knowledge this guru is giving to you that's the message he is giving so uh, arjuna that is really profound what you just shared and the tragedy is that this this symbolism actually got lost we don't know what they signify and why they are the way they are and what are they trying to convey to us uh so do you think that uh, you know they are they have always been they have always existed in this form or the rishis of your uh gave them this form in order to convey certain essential messages to uh, the human beings so that each time they worship these deities they are reminded of their own higher self and how they are supposed to exist and function in the world i don't know like were they created with a certain idea in their mind or like they i mean kind of they were perceived in this way by our rishis and then they kind of uh, gifted uh, these uh, gods uh, to us okay so there is a uh... this has got many uh, you know it's it requires some thinking to answer this question so mm-hmm. are our gods just symbols do they mm-hmm. really exist so right. brahma vishnu shiva durga do mm-hmm. they exist mm-hmm. so uh, there are two 
two different uh, things which we have to understand. First is when you talk about the symbolism of God, of these gods, of course, each of these images, Brahma, the creator, is a creative power. Mm-hmm. Whether uh, Brahma has this form and shape is is the question you are trying to ask, right? Yes, yes. Whether it is just a symbolic representation of the creative power or does he really exist in this form? Mm-hmm. So that is a... Uh, there is, see, there are, uh, what our rishis say is, you, know, you invoke, whenever you pray to a deity in a certain form, you invoke certain powers. You know, mm-hmm. when... The, the whole universe is nothing but God. Everything that exists is God. That is the Advaita philosophy. But uh, uh, during your transaction, you require different powers, right? Let's say when you're going through a very difficult phase, you're invaded with negativity, you need powers to destroy the negative forces in your life. And let's say you're studying, you need knowledge, you need intelligence, you need sharpness, then you require a different power. So mm-hmm. what each this, each of this de- deity does is they invoke the power that you, you are seeking. Mm-hmm. Everything is God. Like uh, ocean is only water. River mm-hmm. is also water. Mm-hmm. Pond is also water. But each of, uh, when they acquire a certain form and certain shape, they perform a certain function. So mm-hmm. you tap into that power. So mm-hmm. when you talk about uh, gods, do they really exist in that particular form? It's like talking about a mantra. You know, Sanskrit, we have mantras. So there is a meaning of ma- for the mantra. So if I just translate it into English and keep repeating it, will it have the same e- effect? The words of the mantra itself are supposed to have a power, no? <clears throat> that is, so the mantra is also one form of God in our religion. Similarly, you have entra, you have sacred diagrams and you can invoke that power in the sacred diagram. And this form of God with a particular weapon and a particular dress is also supposed to have the ability to invoke that power. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the symbolism of the image, there is also a certain esoteric component to our gods. Mm -hmm. Not only the rishis, I am too small a person to explain or uh, be able to, you know, uh, break it down. But those, uh, you cannot dismiss those as merely symbols. I, you have yeah. to also acknowledge I, I, those. Yes, yes. I feel, uh, you know, that they, these are eternal symbols. Uh, yeah. It's like no matter. I don't think that, uh, you know, they were created. They mm-hmm. existed the way they did. And they were kind of perceived by the rishis and then kind of shared with the whole world. Because uh, generally what happens is, and I've seen this in several people that they strictly believe that it is we who give uh, the form to the concept of God. And when they do, I mean, when they start believing in this manner, then it becomes very difficult for them to have any sense of reverence towards the deity from which they are expecting so many blessings. Because then kind of you're placing yourself above the deity. So then what happens is that if like, if this is... Uh, kind of shared with them that it's basically uh, the, the, it's they've always existed and it's how they were perceived and then kind of brought to you yeah. perhaps it would be more empowering for any uh, uh, devotee or sadhana. yeah you know, my way of looking at it, Shivi, is many people dismiss, okay, mm-hmm. even if you don't believe that these are gods, mm-hmm. even if you are no, don't have the faith. See, mm-hmm. uh, the, even I believe that these this are these have come down from our issues, these are revelations. But mm-hmm. even if you don't believe it, even from a purely intellectual point, you can you can appreciate these uh, these symbolism, yeah, how, with the yeah, beauty yeah. and the and the nuance with which it has done, it has been done. So even if you don't go there, even if your faith is a problem for you, mm-hmm. you cannot dismiss it because they're works of brilliance, they're works of great art. I feel. Mm-hmm. So uh, Arjuna, again, I would like to go back to how you have explained the title form of Lord Ganesha. So mm-hmm. you did you actually read about him? Or uh, kind of uh, in your study of Vedanta, you chanced upon this particular uh, uh, aspect of this form of divine. Yeah, I have been, uh, since I heard about this Chin Mudra, Chin Mudra was my first, uh, you know, after I heard about Chin Mudra, I decided I should learn more about it. So I've read a lot about it. I've heard discourses on it. So I've picked it up from various places. Wonderful. Great. Mostly from knowledge of others, book from people. That's how I've learned about it. So, like now, let's come back to uh, Shiva and uh, Vishnu. They also appear Mm. in not one but many, many forms. And each, like Shiva, is in the form of Lingam. 
and uh, or even mm -hmm. Kal Bhairav and Vishnu is worshipped uh, even as uh, Saligram and uh, maybe mm -hmm. some other forms also might not be aware. So why do you think, you know, they are uh, there in so many forms and what they are trying to tell us? So Shivi, this whole uh, universe, again, I want to reiterate, the whole universe is nothing but God, according to our um, philosophy. So different aspects of this God. So when you uh, look at God as everything, you will invoke different aspects of God in different forms. For example, if you take, I spoke about Chinmudra of Dakshinamurti. Dakshinamurti is a form of Sh uh, Shiva as a teacher. Now you can see all the aspects. What are all the things which, which make up a guru? That is, uh, do you hear the noise in the background? Sorry, sorry about the background. Uh, sorry about no the background. Okay, fine. No problem. Yes. Okay, so... Now, let's say Shiva as a lingam itself, let us take. Lingam is, um, again, a very, uh, what to say, not many people are comfortable discussing it. It is considered a phallic symbol. You know, yoni is, uh, yoni is a womb, and lingam is supposed to be a phallus, and uh, uh, Shiva lingam represents the point of creation as the union between Shiva and Shakti. In our, uh, in our tradition, sexuality was not considered a taboo. That is why you have, like, uh, even if you're in, the tem in temples, you'll see a lot of genitals exposed mm -hmm. and many, uh, many uh, you know, sexually explicit images in our temple because that was also considered another aspect of life. It was never considered a taboo subject. So mm -hmm. now, it, if you look at it from the lens of our modern day interpretation, it is not a comfortable topic for many people to discuss. Mm -hmm. But generally, it is considered a phallic symbol. Mm -hmm. Now, Shiva is Nataraja. That's a different topic altogether. Mm -hmm. Then uh, let me talk about Shiva's basic form as mm -hmm. a, you know, as a mendicant. If you mm -hmm. look at Shiva, he has... Uh, three eyes that mm -hmm. represents the sun, moon and the fire. Mm -hmm. The third eye is uh, supposed to represent knowledge. You mm -hmm. know, the, the fire, the third eye is supposed to represent knowledge. That's why when he opens the third eye, mm -hmm. he burns Manmata, the god of desire. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when, you're, when you get knowledge, you're rid of all your desires. The mm -hmm. fire of knowledge burns all your desires, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's the symbolism of the third eye. When your third eye opens... When the eye of knowledge opens, all your desires disappear. And Shiva is supposed to be white, which represents purity. You know, mm -hmm. he's a god of destruction. Why is he white in color, you may wonder. Because mm -hmm. in our tradition, destruction is considered a form of purification. You mm -hmm. see, anything that gets destroyed is actually, you're eliminating the old and rejected and you're renewing something out of it, right? So Shiva is an epitome of purity. That's why Ganga flows from his head. Wonderful. Because Ganga is the ultimate purifier. Mm -hmm. So because it is flowing from his head, it is able to purify everything, even the worst of sins it can purify. Mm -hmm. So even uh, in his hands, no, he has Trishul. Trishul mm -hmm. represents the three aspects of Maya. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. All the three, the entire Maya is under his control. And you can see he wears the moon as his crown jewel, right? Mm -hmm. So moon represents the concept of time. We normally have the lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. So he, he is the master of time. To him, time is just a crown jewel. So all these are represented in the form of Shiva. The, uh, the basic form of Shiva, which you find. Mm -hmm. And then in his various aspects, he represents different uh, manifestation of this form. For example, Shiva is Dakshinamurti is one of my favorite uh, forms. You know, mm -hmm. Dakshinamurti means a, a God who is facing south. So um, Shiva is Dakshinamurti is a, a form of Shiva as Guru. And he is facing south. Dakshin means south, right? Mm -hmm. And most of our gods don't face south because mm -hmm. south is the direction of death. Mm -hmm. uh, direct so by facing uh, Shiva, by facing south, means he's not afraid of death. We're all afraid afraid of death, so we try to turn away from it. And the other reason he's facing south is this knowledge leads to immortality. So all his students have turned away from death and are facing him. Then if you see uh, uh, Dakshinamurti, he'll have, of course, his, uh, his uh, chin mudra in his hand. And under his feet, he will have a, a, a demon called Apasmara, mm -hmm. who represents ignorance. So he has conquered ignorance and uh, he's the master of uh, he's the master of knowledge and also he's very young 
the one of the uh, descriptions of dakshinamurti he is young all his students are old you know mm-hmm. all the sanyasis will be bearded old people but he is very young mm-hmm. that's because this knowledge leads to immortality it's mm-hmm. the ultimate conquest conquest of ignorance is the ultimate conquest and once you conquer it it is immor- you are immortal and mm-hmm. he's sitting under a banyan tree Mm-hmm. he's sitting in a banyan tree and this uh, banyan tree normally has those roots you know mm-hmm. this banyan tree which dakshina uh, murti sits under does not have those hanging roots mm-hmm. this banyan tree represents our thoughts and desires mm-hmm. once we conquer these thoughts and desires one no none of these roots are hanging from the banyan tree then you can see the dakshina murti was right in your then you your mind becomes ripe for knowledge he's sitting right in your heart and he is always smiling i believe he is called swatma ramam the one who is smiling with his own bliss his happiness is so self contained so that is the another uh, uh, another result of this knowledge that is your happiness is in, uh, does not depend on uh, depend on any external factors once mm-hmm. you realize who you really are your happiness comes from within so he is always smiling i believe so that wow. is the symbology of dakshina mood so okay. like the shiva in many different forms have has different meanings mm-hmm. right right i think if we really delve deeper into the meaning of these all these forms of god uh, of divine that we have uh, in the hindu pantheon of uh, gods it will take mm-hmm. us so much deeper to us just you know just going to them and worshiping them and seeking their blessings we will become more self aware which most of us are not because uh, we are so uh, divorced from our tradition our roots our culture the real knowledge that was at the root of the uh, sanatani um, tradition so okay so can uh, shiva we have discussed and uh, yeah vishnu also i think we just discussed very briefly because now he also comes looking very magnificent so he has four arms and one has a uh, lotus and other has uh, you know some uh, the mace he has Shanky. another yes yes another he has shank and one hand is i think in abhay mudra i don't uh, i don't if i remember clearly and he also has some um, some symbol uh, the center uh, yeah. of his chest uh, it's kaustubham uh, and kaustubham uh, uh, mani he has Kaskes. and he has uh, is that on his chest he has another uh, lakshmi also yes, yes. and he has got kaustava maniya and then in another image he is shown uh, lying uh, on the serpent bed and uh, his consort uh, shri lakshmi is always shown sitting at his feet which we yeah. like don't see with shiva shiva is also often times shown as ardhanarishwar so parvati is always his equal whereas uh, in lord vishnu's case she is always had his feet serving lo- very lovingly so again again i just want to know and then the ocean is also uh, made of milk and not of uh, saline water so any yeah. uh, any reason why why he is represented the way he is uh, in our mythology okay okay so for that we should understand the trinity brahma right. vishnu and shiva yeah. see uh, again we have one one god one principle called god and god as a creator is perceived as brahma and god as the sustainer the one who runs the world is uh, is visualized as vishnu and god as the destroyer is shiva mm-hmm. and they, it, and uh, this creation happens because of what is called maya shakti and maya has three qualities sattva rajas and tamas mm-hmm. so brahma is associated with sattva guna mm-hmm. and his wife is saraswati the goddess of learning so if you, in the simplest term if you want to look at it in the simplest terms what is most essential for creating something if you have to create something of mm-hmm. course you need lot of materials but the most important thing is you should know how to do it the knowledge and skill is the most important aspect of creation so brahma the creator his wife is his shakti mm-hmm. wife is not something separate the power of the cre- the creative power is mm-hmm. is depicted as saraswati who is the goddess of learning mm-hmm. so she is the embodiment of all the knowledge that is required for creation so mm-hmm. if you take brahma he has four heads and the four heads are the four vedas okay. the vedas those days vedas were the repository of knowledge mm-hmm. veda itself means knowledge mm-hmm. so he is four and with this knowledge and all his instruments are that of yagna so yagna is the process through which he creates it mm-hmm. and saraswati his wife is his power is the embodiment of all the knowledge of the universe mm-hmm. and vishnu is the 
So is the sustainer and mm -hmm. what do you need most for maintaining something? Even if you want to maintain a house, what you need most is prosperity and wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Because running something takes a lot of uh, material uh, wealth. You need influence, you need money, you need power. So many things are needed to keep something running. So the so goddess of wealth and prosperity is his wife. And Shiva is the destroyer. So his wife is literally time. Kali is derived from the Sanskrit word Kala, which means time. So what is the biggest destroyer? Time. Everything is destroyed in time. So Shiva's power is Kali. So why is Lakshmi alone suppressing the feet? Many people say maybe Vishnu is a very patriarchal deity. Brahma and uh, Shiva have given equal uh, positions to their wives, whereas Vishnu has not given. Mm -hmm. So Vishnu in our symbology represents dharma. You know, how do you run the code, the law of the universe is dharma, like how we have a constitution and a law, right? Mm -hmm. So in our shastras, the law based on which the whole universe function is dharma. So Vishnu is the embodiment of dharma. And Lakshmi is the embodiment of prosperity. So the symbolism of Lakshmi being subservient to Vishnu is that your pursuit of wealth should always be in service of Dharma. You can, uh, your, you, uh, that should not become an overpowering thing. Your pursuit of wealth and prosperity should not be at the expense of Dharma. So your highest priority should be Dharma and, uh, and uh, the pursuit of wealth and prosperity should follow Dharma. That is why Lakshmi is at the feet of Vishnu. Whereas mm -hmm. Shakti, Parvati and uh, Shiva are equal. Time is the power of Shiva and she destroys. She is the destructive power. Uh, of I, I, I like to kind of interrupt you over here. Okay. But when you look at the image of Kali, so there in mm. that form, even Shiva is subservient to her. And not only yes. like, you know, uh, Lakshmi is subservient. She is like very obediently, obediently sitting at his feet and pressing his uh, legs. Whereas here, Kali in a very fierce form has Shiva under her feet. You know, she's pressing him with his feet. He's totally helpless. And that's the fiercest uh -huh. form of the divine. It's very difficult to even worship. Only the bravest can do. Uh, so then how do you explain this phenomena, which you've just explained that okay, she is a time, she is equal. But there is a uh, there's an aspect of her where uh, she is completely boundless. Uh, even Correct. the male form is uh, beneath her. Okay, this is a very, very difficult symbology to understand. I wish I could have, I could show you the picture of Spashana Kali. I'm talk, I know which Kali you're talking about, where she's right. naked and her hair is ah, uh, yes. flying and her Sorry. feet is planted on Shiva and Shiva yeah. appears to be dead. So let me give you a description. She's, I'm not able to share the image. Shiva will be lying dead at her feet. Her feet will be planted on Shiva's chest. Her oh, hair yeah. will be loose. She'll be naked. She'll be in the in the smashanam, in the mm -hmm. burial ground. Mm -hmm. One hand, she'll be holding a severed head of a person. She'll be wearing a garland of severed heads. Mm -hmm. And she'll be wearing a skirt of sev severed hands. Severed and she'll hands. be pitch black Human in hands. color. Yes, yeah. yes. Actually, she was so frightening that when the British first called, uh, saw that image, they called her the Indian demon. They were so, it was such a frightening image. Nobody, they could not imagine it as a godly figure. But... Mm -hmm. uh, there is something so deeply like I think uh, it is the epitome of symbolism, how beautifully mm -hmm. they've symbolized an important concept using uh, this mm -hmm. image of Kali. So I said, Kali, it's Mashana Kali represents, represents the time of dissolution when the whole universe has been destroyed and dissolved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Kali is the principle of time. And, uh, you know, her... Uh, uh, um, her open hair represents her complete freedom. You know, generally women are not allowed to leave their hair open. Hair mm -hmm. is such a contentious topic for women, right? Yeah. So you plait your hair when you're a young person. Then mm -hmm. in our parents or grandparents' generation, once you're married, you wear a, wear a bun. Then you mm -hmm. shave off your hair when, you're, um, when you become okay. a widow. So those, so hair is a, hair is a, you know, it, uh, it, uh, it, it is a symbolism for how uh, you are limited by certain boundaries. That's what hair represents. So uh, by letting her hair lose, it represents her total freedom. And you know, she will have 50 heads, severed ah. heads. Ah. So 50 heads is, uh, 50 is the number of alphabets, Sanskrit alphabets. So when you say, uh, when you talk about creation, you know, the first created entity is supposed to be sound. So the severed head represents the potential for next creation. 
So although the heads are severed and hanging around the head, this is potentially available for next creation. The next creation will begin with this sound. And then the hand represents, you know, you do all actions with your hand. Hand represents Kriya Shakti. So all our karmas no, are represented by hands. So the severed hands represent that all these karmas have become dormant now. But they will come back again. So these hands represent the dormant nature of karma. And then, you know, Shiva is the consciousness principle. Mm -hmm. And Shiva has cannot do anything without his she. So mm -hmm. Shiva is equal to Shava without Shakti. But at the same time, Shakti cannot function unless she is established in Shiva. So her feet is on Shiva saying all her functioning power comes from Shiva. But Shiva himself has the, is useless without her. So it represents a symbiotic relationship between Shiva and Shakti. And more than anything, what is most beautiful about this Kali, what you will miss about this Kali are her two hands, you know. Mm -hmm. One will be in Abhaya Mudra and one will be in Varada Mudra. Mm -hmm. You must have seen these mudras. Abhaya Mudra means don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Be fearless. I am there with you. So you have nothing to be afraid of. This is Abhaya Mudra. Varada Mudra is... The uh, uh, hand for giving boons, whatever you see, I'll give you. So even though she's so fierce, she's holding these mudras, reminding us that she's after all a mother. So if you really know me, you will know that I'm your mother and I'm here to protect you. So even in that fierce form, they've given her these two mudras. Uh, so this Mashana Kali is an amazing, amazing work of art, work of beauty and work of philosophy. Actually, I'm reminded of something of which I had a first-hand experience uh, or rather some realization had dawned upon me regarding uh, the pair of uh, Shiva and Durga or Kali, whatever you say. And that was like very long ago. And I was perhaps in a state of deep meditation. And you know what happened to me? I could see because I was uh, worshipping or rather calling upon uh, the form of Shiva, like Shiva and Shakti. And then what I saw was that uh, uh, all of a sudden, I'm I, I'm praying to Shiva and I'm offering him water and other things. And all of a sudden, his form be begins to change. And I was like very afraid. And why is he changing from somebody looking so benign to something so fierce? And then he just changed form into uh, that of a tiger. And then what I saw is that the Parvati, mother goddess, she came, she comes and she sits on him. And then I saw, oh my God, he anyways wear the bagambar, right? his uh, dress is of a, uh, the, of, of the tiger. tiger skin. And hmm. then I was able to connect it to, okay, her uh, vahanam is her husband herself. They are never separate, even in the battlefield. So like hmm. we think that, uh, okay, just the Kali, uh, sorry, the goddess who goes and kills all the demons and he just, uh, relieves Mother Earth of all her suffering. But even there, she is accompanied by uh, Shiva. So she, the two are never separate. And that was Absolutely. like a huge revelation for me. Okay, my God, okay, this is what it means. Yeah, so actually, just, you see Shiva's image, Shivi, you will see two, he will have two different earrings. Uh, one earring worn by women and one earring worn, worn by men. Uh -huh. It is to indicate that no time, at no time, Shiva will ever be separated from uh, Parvati. Shamba uh, Sadashiva yes. is always with... Uh, Always, even in the yeah. battlefield, he is there in the form of a tiger. So that's the yeah. tiger is not a separate entity. That's, that's his work. True. Okay, so also can we uh, talk about uh, Narsimha? Uh, Nataraja. Narasimha, you want. Narasimha, no, if you, if you want, we can talk, discuss Nataraja also. Let's take it one by one. So okay. let's discuss Nataraja then. Okay, you want to go with Nataraja first? Nah, because, okay. okay. Narasimha is basically, uh, maybe briefly I'll tell you, it's part of Dashavatara. See, mm -hmm. some of it you know, is uh, symbolically deep and some of it is uh, is based on our Puranas. Dashavatara itself, they say, is uh, has contains the elements of evolution. So if mm -hmm. you see Matsya, Matsya is uh, first fish, mm -hmm. then Kurma is a tortoise, amphibian. From, a, from an aquatic thing, you get a amphibian. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Varaha is... Uh, Varaha is a boar, you get a mammal, a land animal. Varaha, then you have Narasimha. Narasimha mm -hmm. is half animal and half human. It mm -hmm. is supposed to represent uh, uh, an evolution, uh, the concept of evolution, how the whole uh, life forms evolved from, from uh, base to, to the uh, superhuman form. We, uh, like uh, Krishna is supposed to be a superhuman with all the technological powers that he mm -hmm. possesses now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, like, can you like like talk a little about bit about the Kalki avatar who was like very much uh, in talks currently because uh, the common perception is that we are at the crux of a major dimensional shift uh, in the Earth energies. Maybe we are entering a new yoga. So, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding this subject. So, according to you, Archana, what do you think? Again, uh, does Kalki represent the the element of uh, you know the anger or the the of destruction present in all of us where we collectively want to cleanse the planet of whatever adharma is um, you know, existing in it. And it, he may not be a separate entity as we uh, consider him to be. Because that is what you uh, like you just refer to. Uh, See, Kalki Avatar, no, if you go by our Puranic text, it is mm -hmm. a long way to go yeah, because we are not even in the middle of uh, Kali Yuga. So mm -hmm. many thousands of years later only, if you go by our textual references on the time frame of when Kalki will appear, he a um, few, many more thousand years to go before Kalki actually appears. But mm -hmm. if you look at uh, avatars, these 10 avatars are supposed to be just a you know, sample of the total avatars. Because uh, regularly, like in uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, whenever there is a yada yada hi dharma, so dharma whenever sir. the dharma is going down mm -hmm. and whenever... Um, bad is increasing, when mm -hmm. all negative energies uh, become powerful, oh, nice, when yes. good people suffer, I will come and make sure mm -hmm. that uh, good people are protected and the bad is destroyed. Mm -hmm. So it happens all the time. Maybe we don't, uh, we have just representatively talked about 10 avatars, even Shankaracharya is considered an avatara of Shiva. Mm -hmm. Shiva. So we don't have to wait for one particular Kalki to come. No, so yes. every yuga, every uh, generation, mm -hmm. Whenever there is a decline of uh, decline of goodness, decline of dharma, decline of righteousness, I will come and make sure that yes. the righteousness. And it may not the necessarily be the, in the physical form. Well, he is yeah. the one, and he is going to destroy. I think he is exists in all of us, and in a collective angst to kind of yes. change things for the better and fight a dharma. And so maybe he uh, the texts are uh, the our scriptures are talking about this aspect. And obviously, yes. since the human mind and the memory works in a certain way, so kind mm -hmm. of just to embed this in our mind, certain shapes and forms uh, could have been given. I'm just uh, kind of... Uh, Possible, yes. No, this is just a conjecture, may not be fine. So, yes, and um, any like any other god? Uh, yes, Nataraja. Yeah, we were right, Nataraja. We yeah, have, one of my favorite yes, 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 uh, yes, yes, representation yes. of Shiva because it went in my YouTube channel. I've done several videos on Nataraja yes. because Nataraja has so many, again, many different interpretations of Nataraja. And even uh, in the West, even Western physicists have had a lot of our intrigue, are intrigued by his form. So at the basic level, let me tell you at a philosophical level what Nataraja represents. Mm -hmm. Nataraja represents the process of continuous creation and destruction. Yeah, uh, no, no. Shiva is a dancer. Now, Shiva, he, uh, if you see in South Indian temples, in Brahadeshwara temple, he is represented in all the 108 movements of Natya Shastra. In Bharatanatyam, they have 108 different movements described in Natya Shastra, Bharatanatyam. Mm -hmm. And he is, uh, there are uh, uh, sculptures of him dancing in all the 108 poses of Natya Shastra. But there is one particular form of Nataraja, which is very, very famous. It's called Ananda Tandavam. So mm -hmm. I wish I could show you the image. He'll be holding his hand like this mm -hmm. and there'll be a ring of fire around mm -hmm. him. I don't know whether he's a very uh, popular image. It's a very, enough, yes, it's very much popular. It's, I think you can find it on, in most homes, especially in yes. the drawing room. Please. So that, is, uh, that has uh, generated a lot of interest all over the world. In fact, there is an Ataraja in CERN because many physicists have described his dance as a dance of subatomic particles. So mm -hmm. let me tell you what is the philosophy it represents. Mm -hmm. If you see Ataraja has four hands, mm -hmm. in two of his hands, he'll have a drum and fire. Mm -hmm. So the drum represents sound. In our, according to our Genesis, if you look at our Puranas, how they describe the creation, the first created entity is space and the nature of space is sound. Mm -hmm. So Om is, that is why it's, uh, is considered the sound of creation. So the drum represents creation and the fire represents destruction. And if you see, it will be uniform in equal position. His hands, will, these two will be equally positioned. Mm -hmm. So how um, he balances in order for for the universe to function, creation and destruction should be uniformly balanced. 
So if you're only destroying, universe will be destroyed. But if you're only creating and destruction doesn't happen, you will be flooded. It will not work. Even so, that will uh, lead to destruction eventually. Yeah. So creation and destruction is uniformly balanced in him. Mm -hmm. huh? And the circle of fire, the circle of fire around him represents the cyclic nature of creation. And then if you see uh, on his feet again, there is a demon called Apasmara. Apasmara literally means epilepsy. You know, like the epilepsy, but actually it is a representation of chaos. So he, in order for uh, creation to happen, he suppresses chaos under his feet. So the chaos is suppressed and that's how he brings about order in the world. Then one hand you will see Abhaya Mudra. See like this he'll have. One hand Abhaya Mudra. The other hand is called Gajahasta Mudra, which is elephant trunk. So for in order for just, just whatever I described about Ganesha, his range of skills, he's skilled in so many different things. That's his range of skills, Gajahasta Mudra. Then one leg is lifted, which shows what is required for you to escape this continuous cycle of creation and destruction. For that, you need to learn detachment because we are all the time attached to the world. We keep coming back to the world again and again. So detachment, it represents. And by representing the whole, da whole creation as dance, what they indicate is the only real thing in this universe is Shiva, is God. Everything else from the stars to the planets to the tiny little atoms are just different expressions of his dance. They have no substantiality. Only thing real, only thing substantial about creation is Shiva. Everything else is just an illusion. That's what is represented in uh, the dance of Nataraja. And uh, many physicists say that is like a very accurate representation of the creation and destruction of subatomic particles. Right. You know, so and, how, uh, how, how was Pizzesus able to link uh, uh, Tataraja with all these uh, scientific truths? You know, because mostly they are very skeptical about anything divine. They are like constantly trying to uh, look for the divine in the laboratories, mm -hmm. and which is, I don't think, possible unless and until you go on a self inventory. Mm -hmm. So then, this linking uh, yeah. Tataraja with uh, the, the, the truths or the facts of science. Is uh, something really which is uh, which I am able to? I'm not able to understand how were they able to reach to this point. Uh, yeah, I'm also. I don't know how they got introduced to Nataraja, but I've re I read many physics books by eminent physicists who talk about Nataraja. One of the first books I wrote, uh, read by, uh, by a physicist is this uh, Tao of Physics by a mm -hmm. physicist mm -hmm. who talks about how this, uh, if you look at uh, these subatomic sub particles, which continuously gets created and destroyed, destroyed. Created and destroyed. it is a perfect representation. Shiva's uh, dance, Ananda Thandavam, is a perfect representation of that. And then mm -hmm. more recently, I read this book called Order of Time by mm -hmm. a famous uh, Italian physicist, mm -hmm. where he talks about what is time actually. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it really exists, what is the nature mm -hmm. of time. And throughout, mm -hmm. he uses Nataraja as, a, as an example, as a metaphor to describe time. And he uses it so beautifully, perfectly as it is described in our text, the symbolism of Nataraja. Mm -hmm. So it has fascinated physicists all over the world, mm -hmm. this idol of Nataraja. Great. And um, so, yeah, so that's I'm really unable to think of any uh, more divine forms we can discuss. A anything else you have in your on your mind which you can talk about? Um, yeah, see, uh, maybe I'll, uh, you need not go to this deep philosophical concepts of Nataraja and Kali, even simple things, uh, mm -hmm. even simple symbol, like Ganesha I spoke about, the mm -hmm. simple symbology. Right. Now take example for Saraswati, sure, one of her Vahanam is a Hamsa. Mm -hmm. Hamsa, you know, is a, is a, is a, legendary bird it's not a real bird normally you think of it as a swan but it's mm -hmm. not a swan it's a it's a bird from our puranas which is mm -hmm. supposed to have very special ability so when you put a bowl of milk mixed with water in front of hamsa it will absorb only the milk and leave out the water i believe mm -hmm. so it it is a representation of wisdom saraswati mm -hmm. the goddess of knowledge rides on wisdom mm -hmm. the ability to discern right from wrong this world which is so mixed up with good and bad, which is so hard mm. to discriminate. What knowledge endorses is that wisdom, the ability to take out what is right and what is good from this totally mixed up world. And that is why uh, Rishis are called Paramahamsa, because mm. they make the ultimate distinction of removing the unreal from the real and only taking the real. 
Ganesha also is uh, escorted by Riddhi and Siddhi. They are considered to be his wives. Uh, so, like, what do Riddhi and Siddhi represent? So, if you have all the qualities which Ganesha embodies, Riddhi is in the north. Here, they call it Siddhi and Buddhi. Achha, so, achha. you have accomplishment and intelligence. Both will be your wives, mm -hmm. your Shaktis. So, Siddhi is accomplishment. If you have all these qualities, success will naturally be your companion. And Buddhi, okay. intelligence will be your companion. Okay, okay, fine. And then we also have the goddesses of wealth and uh, wisdom and power. So why do you think that they are in feminine form and not in the masculine form? Okay, uh, see, in our uh, tradition, that's what all powerful entities are generally female in our, <laughs> in our uh, presentation. So mm -hmm. in uh, the... Um, it, that goes back to the Vedantic concept. Mm -hmm. See, the whole universe is supposed to be just consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this consciousness manifests into how do, into this world through, through a power called Maya, Maya mm -hmm. Shakti. So um, this consciousness is represented as a male principle, but mm -hmm. he cannot do anything uh, without his mm -hmm. power. The power, the Maya Shakti. So Maya Shakti, because Maya Shakti is part of this Brahman, mm. it is uh, it is represented as a female entity. Mm. So all the power, the power of any god is represented as a female entity. So all this That's knowledge, is it supposed to be something very esoteric or were common people uh, not considered eligible for this form of knowledge? And this got lost in time and like it's taking people like you to again bring it back to conscious memory. Um, why did it happen? Like, were people kept away from it, or kind of they were like more comfortable simply worshiping them as the blessing givers and really not into finding out the deeper meaning? Why do you think that we came so far from no. this wealth that so we I, had? In our I think what was traditionally taught to us was no longer taught to us, so it got lost. Now you have to learn all this out of your own interest. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure in our tradition, all this information would have been passed on to us. We would have learned it. So when we learned, looked at the images of God, we would have understood what they meant because it would have been part of our learning process. It would have been mm -hmm. part of our curriculum. Then it got replaced by a totally new modern education system, which does not encompass yes, yes. all this. Pradeep Krishnan, he says that uh, the long invasions, they destroyed all this knowledge that we had in our possession. And now we have only these uh, scraps of, you know, the, we, we have very little of uh, what we were we actually possess. So I think that's a very uh, apt observation, Pradeep Ji. Yes, uh, a lot of foreign invasions and especially the destruction of great universities uh, yes. actually gave us a big body blow in that, uh, in this particular area. And uh, we actually had, we lost this, uh, this great wealth that we all, always had in a position and now it's such a tragedy that it's the western scholars who are delving deeper into it and now kind of giving yeah. it back to us so anyways uh, better late than never uh, ma'am uh, can you please explain the symbolism between kartikeya kartikeya yes that is a difficult symbolism uh, symbolism to explain. Actually, Kartikeya is supposed to represent a form of Tantra. You know, uh, 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 he has six heads. That is, repre uh, that is uh, he represents the six uh, stages of uh, spiritual development, the Kundalini Shakti. If you've heard of uh, the ta uh, Tantra practice, uh, there is supposed to be a seat of energy, which is at the base of our spine. And as we are uh, spiritual uh, wisdom and spiritual knowledge increases, this energy raises up our spine and reaches the head, which is called Sahasrara. So the six uh, levels through which the spiritual, spiritual energy passes through represents the six heads of uh, Kartikeya. Actually, his knowledge, that is why it's a very difficult symbolism to understand. His, uh, I think one of the easiest things to understand is his weapon. His weapon is veil. Veil, you know, the veil is supposed to have a pointed tip, a broad, uh, it, it is in the shape of a uh, leaf. And then you have a big, uh, uh, big stick, no? Anybody has seen a veil? I don't know, sir, if you've seen a veil who, which Kartikeya holds. It is supposed to represent knowledge. How and how knowledge should be. It should be sharp, broad and deep. That's what that veil represents. 
and uh, with with this veil he uh, uh, with the power of knowledge the rays of spiritual energy is represented by his six heads should one keep a nataraja in the house people have a lot of questions in this regard so in nataraja i have um, see in our part of the world in south india what they say is you should not keep a krishna with a flute Mm. the flute playing krishna nataraja i've never heard uh, any uh, issues with nataraja but generally when you have idols at home and when you think of them as uh, 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 for worshiping then you have to do have certain processes which you follow like doing abhishekam nevedyam and all that but if you're simply having it as a as a piece of art for display that is uh, that is a different matter but as far as nataraja is concerned i've never heard that uh, It's, it's uh, not supposed to be kept at home. You can keep a natraja. But why shouldn't we keep a Krishna playing flute in our homes? Like I don't know. It's a center. <laughs> it's supposed to be this flute. No, it's supposed to be how he puts everybody into a state of Maya, absorbed in Maya. So it's supposed. Generally, I think it was. It is just some sentimental value. I don't. I've not read it anywhere, but I've just heard it from my parents and relatives that mm-hmm. if you keep uh, keep a, a flute playing Krishna, he will keep you entrenched in Maya. Hmm. Okay. So there, there's a lot of symbology. There's a lot of symbolism attached to almost every single action of them. For example, even when Krishna stands in a certain way, you know, these are like uh-huh. the manga it is called. so people attach a lot of meaning to that as well that there is a certain meaning to, to, to why he is uh, standing the way he is this is uh, quite baffling because most people don't uh, you know can even uh, give a second thought to these kind of things for them krishna playing a flute and st- standing with a certain tail means that he is a charmer and he is a stealer of hearts and he is calling for everybody to come and fall in love with him so that is the general perception that we people have uh, but maybe you know the people scientific minded people like you maybe uh, looking at it from a very different uh, angle i just want to know what is the perspective of uh, people like you regarding this the way the, the certain way krishna stands and plays his role is it about maya is it about cosmos yeah, actually about... i remember reading <laughs> about yeah uh, yes yeah tribhanga i have heard but i uh, don't recall now uh, shivi on what is the significance of the tribhanga uh-huh. stand i don't know whether it require it is the three uh, uh the aspects of uh, uh maya the mm. chatva rajas and tamas i am not able to recall now i'm sorry mm. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, the uh, what you spoke about you know some people just appreciating krishna as the um, mm. as the person who steals uh, steals uh, dams uh, cl- dams his clothes he is a uh, beautiful he plays the flute i think no there is a beauty to appreciating different aspects of our gods mm. even uh, in bhagavad gita no there is a very beautiful verse describing bhagavad gita mm. he, it's like a lotus i believe bhagavad gita from far when you see you can appreciate its beauty and if you are a if you are a bee you can go and suck its honey but mm. it doesn't mean that person who is appreciating is the beauty of a lotus from far is any less than the person who is up who is able to suck honey from uh, the lotus Nectar, right? right so it is nice that uh, at different levels based on your level of you know level of understanding maturity and intellect you can appreciate our uh, gods you know at our, each person can get out something out of the images of our gods right and vishnu is also shown as uh, you know a lotus is coming from his navel and then yeah. uh, uh, brahma is shown to be sitting on it now this is also yeah. something very uh, baffling so yes. why should a lotus be coming from the navel and then another god is sitting on it this is uh, what is the significance of this particular oh. image zanganatha uh, swami is again a very very beautiful and very deeply symbolic image of uh, vishnu you know vishnu lying and sleeping mm-hmm. and uh, brahma emerging from the navel is a representation of illusionary nature of uh, our uh, universe it's a very deep vedantic concept mm-hmm. you know in vedanta the whole world is called illusion the entire universe is nothing but consciousness and all the things which you see all the variety that you see is only an illusion mm. so for that they'll give a they give an analogy in vedanta of a dream like mm. when you sleep what happens the entire dream exists in your mind mm. it's a product of your consciousness but you see mountains rivers lakes and so many material things in your dream 
but they're not material at all they're just products of your consciousness right mm-hmm. so that's what um, the sleeping ranganatha represents he's lying down and the whole universe is nothing but his dream and why does the lotus come from his navel as i said the first created entity according to our shastras is sound and the base of the sound is supposed to be the origin of our sound is supposed to be navel i mean mm-hmm. all sounds originate from our navel so as he's lying down and dreaming the universe the space is emerging mm-hmm. sound or space is emerging from his navel so it is the emergence of space as vishnu dreams of the dreams of the universe and you know his bed is adi shesha no with mm-hmm. thousands of heads that is supposed to represent our karmas shesha means snake but shesha also means what is left mm-hmm. over yes. so all our left over karmas are the cause of the next universe so we don't exhaust our karmas right every living beings have their left over karmas mm-hmm. so that left over karma is the cause of the next universe so his bed is adi shesha all our karmas act as his bed and puts vishnu to sleep and he dreams up the universe that is the symbology of the sleeping vishnu okay so uh, archana tell me a lot of being a lot has been discussed about time the time is an illusion i want to know uh, is it also linked to space time and space are very quite deeply interlinked so if time is an illusion isn't space too an illusion uh, no uh, according to our karma shastras the whole universe is an illusion Uh, time and space, space and everything every, is an illusion every, every, everything everything yeah so so where there is no time there is no space either yes and uh, how to even you know imagine such a such a such i don't know what how which word to use but this particular yeah. idea itself where there is no space and time so i what what is there instead how to yes. you know see yourself in that in a in a place like this yeah so you know, in fact in uh, shivi the f- very first one of the oldest rigvedic hymn is called uh, nasadiya sukta there mm-hmm. they dis- they also wonder the same thing even today physicists are struggling with it there was neither existence there was neither non existence mm-hmm. it says that's how the na sat means mm-hmm. there was neither non existence mm-hmm. so it's an absence of even non existence whenever you say there is existence an absence of it is non existence so they imagine a state where there is an absence of non existence also so mm. it is something so indescribable and mm. even today 4000 years back we wondered about it and even today physicists are wondering about it that is the nature of the city yeah and even things like that the uh, uh, where there was uh, neither darkness nor light now for a mind which only knows duality what is beyond these two uh, phenomena it's like it's like beyond our grasp okay if Correct. either it's darkness or it's light what is the third entity Yeah. which neither darkness nor light what what is there how to describe how to feel how to perceive yeah. that's like the so something yeah. it's very very uh, otherworldly too metaphysical for the common uh, human to understand yes. it's like uh, it's totally very very, yeah, very difficult to conceive also of something like that acha like shank chakra gada and padmanam i think this is what he had uh, been trying to tell me that what vishnu is adorned with shank chakra gada and yes yeah actually shankar represents the uh, material world mm-hmm. chakra represents the, see um, it is uh, the panchabhutas mm-hmm. uh, and uh, intellect mind and intellect these are all the various components according to our what is the universe comprised of this is what our shastra says mm-hmm. the panchabhutas the mind and the intellect mm-hmm. so you have shankar represents the panchabhutas Uh, chakram represents the intellect and gada represents the mind intellect the sharp thing represents the intellect and gada represents the mind mm. so all the uh, components of creation are in his hands that's what uh, that's what those instruments represent mm. so every actually the um, uh, whatever the gods hold in their hands are very very uh, special mm. they are the ones which gives the full the entire most of the symbolism of the deity is embodied in the, in the weapons and the symbols which they are holding in their hand so uh, arjuna uh, i i think i did hear somebody and there was a statement i heard that you not know, why do you even uh, want to describe god as love you said even a dog has a lot of love if you have to you know, perceive or think of god things in terms of intelligence 
limitless, fathomless intelligence. You can never measure it, never quantify it, never ever even understand it. So don't ever, you know, measure it with love. Love is too small a thing. Look at his intelligence, infinite intelligence. And that's really actually the truth. If you see, love is so still easier to understand, relate to. Intelligence mm -hmm. is, it's, it's infinite. It's very difficult to, you know, see any end, beginning or end of this whole uh, thing called intelligence, especially the divine intelligence with which he has created the entire mm -hmm. universe, planets, multiverses are there, black holes are there and whatnot. We are still discovering, finding and yeah. not finding any end It's uh, to this yeah. uh, infinite intelligence of the divine. Great. Uh, I think we may have two more uh, unconditional. Dolan Acharya says that God is unconditional love. Yeah, oh. that's true. <laughs> But he's also a limitless, infinite intelligence. Yes. There, there <laughs> are yogis maybe who have reached this level of unconditional love. Mm. But has there been anybody who has been able to match the intelligence of the divine? I don't think there has been anybody. Mm. Anybody. Okay. So just talking about unconditional love, which he spoke about. Mm. So uh, that is, uh, you know, when you, when you are a re realized soul, you are, you, are, you are supposed to have Sarvatma Bhava. The mm -hmm. whole universe is you. So what is the highest Sorry. form of love? It's our self-love. See, all kinds of love can come and go, but our love for our own self can never go, no? So Sarvatma Bhava is looking at the whole universe as your self. You love everything as your own self. So that is Sarvatma Bhava. That's one, one of the qualities of a realized person, actually. Mm -hmm. That is why God is called, is uh, described as infinite love because mm -hmm. everything is God. So everything is himself. So how can you la not love anything about yourself? No. So that is why God is called infinite love. In infinite love. And with yeah. love, he has made the whole universe and everything. Yeah. Small, the tiniest of things to the biggest of things. Great. Um, Okay, thank you, Arjuna. Thank you for this thank wonderful you. session. It was hugely enlightening. And thank you, uh, we look forward to more such talks with you. We have a wealth of wisdom to share from our scriptures and how they are linked with current modern science, technology, and the scientific discoveries, which just end up validating which has already been known to us since yes. eons. Thank you so much, Arjuna, for being on the show. I just express my heartfelt gratitude to you, to you on behalf of all my listeners. Uh, and the leaders and subscribers of Life Post. Thank you so much. Vera. Thank you so much, Shivi. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure having this discussion with you.